Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. So we're going to be doing something a little bit special today. This one's been requested a few times, uh, so I thought I'd finally get around to it. Um, just a quick um, note on that as well. If anyone's actually requested anything, um, it is on the schedule, but um, bear in mind that I do record these ahead of time. Um, you know, the next four, maybe even five weeks ahead of when these videos actually come out is, is probably already been recorded. So I do have them on a schedule um, and I'm slowly working my way through the uh, said schedule. It's just that the schedule is massive <laughs> and um, sometimes things do pop up like, you know, uh, Oversimplified might drop another video or, you know, Kings and Generals will release another part on Ukraine, for example. So I tried to get around to those first um, just to kind of um, get on them while they're hot kind of thing as opposed to, you know, trying to leave them for too long. So I do get around to the schedule, but just bear in mind that they are recorded ahead of time. But do keep the suggestions coming because I do need them. Um, the bigger a schedule I can build up, the better, because it means I've got plenty of stuff to work on. Um, so we're going back to Epic History TV and we're going back to something a little bit special today. So this is um, something kind of unique for them, I think, as well, because it's not a video about a particular battle or war or something like that. It's about just a single ship, which is HMS Victory. Um, and if that wasn't the most triumphant name for a ship ever, I don't know what is, um, except probably HMS Triumphant, I guess. Um, but for anyone that's, I don't know if there are many people that will not have heard of this ship, but if you haven't heard of the ship, it's the oldest commissioned ship in the world. Um, not the oldest commissioned ship still afloat. That honor goes to the USS Constitution, which is one of the original 13 frigates built for the US Navy. Um, Victory is in commission, but it's not afloat. It sits in dry dock, but Victory was built before Constitution. Um, Victory, of course, was very famous for its role as Admiral Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar, um, but it had a very um, storied career before that as well, um, which I'm sure this video will get into. Um, and still today, it actually serves as the flagship of the first Sea Lord, which is essentially, for all intents and purposes, the Commander-in-Chief of the Royal Navy. Um, so it still has a ceremonial role today. Um, so we're just going to dive straight in. So um, as always, if you like this video, please leave a like and some comments, um, leave some suggestions for future videos too. Um, also, please make sure that you check out the original video too. There'll be a link to Epic History TV and the original video in the description. But let's just dive straight in. This is a 30 minute video, so depending on how much I have to say, we'll maybe split this into two parts. Um, I'm gonna try and actually keep my reaction videos a bit shorter uh, now because, um, you know, 15 minute content does better than say 45 minute content. So I'll try and keep the reaction videos between sort of 15 and 20 minutes from now, I think. So um, this video probably will end up being, well, it definitely will end up being two parts because it's 30 minutes long. So, uh, but depends on how much I have to say. Uh, but let's just dive straight in. 1805, Britain is at war with France. The French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte will soon dominate mainland Europe. But at sea, Britain's Royal Navy reigns supreme. That year, Napoleon wins one of his greatest victories against the Russians and Austrians at Austerlitz. But six weeks earlier, off the coast of Spain, the British win a battle of much more lasting strategic significance. Off Cape Trafalgar, the Royal Navy inflicts a crushing defeat on the combined fleet of France and Spain. Enemy losses are devastating. British naval superiority will not be seriously challenged again for the rest of the war. Britain goes on to play a leading role in Napoleon's eventual defeat. Its greatest contribution, its wooden walls. The Royal Navy. Britain is the world's largest naval power. With 136 ships of the line and 110,000 men at sea. So just a quick note on these. I don't know if I was going to get into this or not, but um, so before the era of battleships, a ship of the line is for all intents and purposes, a battleship. It's the big guns of the fleet. So you tend to keep ships of the line close to home, whereas like the frigates, so your workhorses of the fleet, they're the ships that are going um, 
you know, uh, across the oceans and things like that, where ships are the line you tend to keep closer to home or to centers of strategic importance, at least. Um, and actually, for a long time, the um, most sought after captaincy in the Royal Navy or pretty much any Navy at this time was to be captain of a frigate because you essentially had a lot more latitude. Um, but just a quick note on these rates. So, um, so a rate um, at this time, and this wasn't just the British Navy that used this either, pretty much every major Navy in the world used this kind of system. Um, a rate is um, how many guns the ship carries. So a first rate is usually, say, I think it's around, you know, the rating system did fluctuate between the navies. Um, just point that out as well. The French Navy, for example, used a very slightly different system than the Royal Navy, but for all intents and purposes, they were all pretty much the same. Um, so a first rate was the most heavily armed ship. It was usually 80 guns plus. So it, the ship carried 80 cannons or more. Um, and as the rates go down, you tend, you know, the, the number of guns got fewer and fewer. Um, so HMS Victory had around 100 guns on board. Wasn't even the most heavily armed ship of its day either. Um, I think that honor goes to the Santa Sima Trinidad um, of the Spanish Navy, uh, which actually fought at Trafalgar as well. Um, that ship had about 120 guns on board. Not all the guns were of the same caliber. You know, the Santa Sima Trinidad, for example, it may, it may have had a lot of guns, but they weren't particularly heavy guns, most of them. Whereas Victory, it did have um, a battery of very heavy guns. So the, the caliber of the guns would change as well. Um, and ships of the line, I think, go down to fourth rate, I think. And then fifth and sixth rate are the frigates, uh, which tend to carry between sort of 20 or so, I think it's like 28 to around uh, 38 guns normally, you know. Um, the American frigates were bigger because the Americans didn't build ships of the line. So you had American frigates that were, say, like 44 guns, you know, um, much bigger frigates. Um, and anything under that was generally classed as just a sloop, a sloop of war, it was called. And that was just anything from, you know, under the rate of a frigate. So that's the rating system of um, the navies at the time. The Navy protects the homeland from invasion. It allows Britain to project force into Europe with raids and expeditionary forces. It cuts off enemy trade while protecting Britain's own. It isolates and seizes overseas colonies, including the vastly profitable sugar islands of the West Indies. And key to that as well, though, is that by virtue of that, it means that the Navy has to be dispersed around the world as well. Um, so, yes, the Royal Navy is the most powerful navy in the world at this time collectively, but it's also spread out right across the planet. You know, you've got squadrons in Canada, you've got squadrons in the Caribbean, you've got squadrons in India, you know, the navy, you've got squadrons in the Mediterranean, places like Malta, you know, the navy's just all over. So, even though it is the most powerful and most well-trained navy, it's also widely dispersed. So, when you combine fleets like the French and Spanish, um, you know, you especially the French fleet, which was much more concentrated in Europe, um, that's what presents the threat. It undermines enemy economies, while allowing Britain to use its own financial strength to sustain its allies. In two decades of war with France, Britain wins a series of naval battles that ensure it can carry out these war-winning strategies effectively necessarily call the glorious first of June a victory that was kind of more of a stalemate you know that was the first major naval battle of the French Revolutionary Wars and both navies were pretty rusty at this point so there was a lot of kinks tying out that that battle um, brought to the surface um, but yeah all these other battles were certainly victories among the Royal Navy's most formidable warships HMS victory a first-rate ship of the line the most powerful class of warship afloat. 104 guns, 820 men. A single broadside from victory packs more weight of iron than every gun in Wellington's army at Waterloo. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know it was that heavy. That's incredible. Especially to consider, so it might have 104 guns, but for the most part, they're split up between two batteries, one starboard and one port. 
Um, a few, you know, quite a lot of ships had what were called bow and stern chasers, which were guns on the front and the back of the ship to fire forward and backwards. But you only had, you know, they were generally maybe a pair of guns. And on the top of the deck, you sometimes had very big um, caliber weapons, but, you know, you could maneuver them much easier, and they were called carronades. And that was something that was, I think, invented during this war, actually. And it was essentially just a, an enormous shotgun um, that were used to, like, clear decks and things like that. Um, but they were huge calibers, but they were much smaller than an, an, a regular cannon. Um, so you have to consider, even though it's 104 guns, on paper that's about 52 guns either side. So, and Wellington's army at Waterloo had, what, just shy of 200 guns? Somewhere around that figure? But that, So that's incredible. That just shows just how big these naval guns actually were. Some of these naval guns were massive. You know, um, it wasn't at all uncommon to find guns that could fire 32 pounds worth of shot in one, in one shot. Um, so the, just another thing to mention is that's how broadsides were measured um, in these days, which is on paper, how many guns does the ship have facing to one side? On paper, what's the caliber of these guns? Because batteries of guns weren't fixed like in you know on the like iron battleships that you got in the late 19th century um guns could be swapped out you know quite regularly you know if a ship ran aground for example or if it was docked and you needed the guns on land you could just wheel the guns off the ship and you could like swap the guns around and things like that so the batteries weren't fixed so it's on paper how many guns do you have facing one side how many you know what caliber of guns are these and then you add up the shot that each gun can fire in one volley. And that's the weight of the broadside that it can fire. So that's how broadsides were measured. So in theory, one shot from each cannon on one side throws X amount of um, pounds or kilos of iron at the enemy. This is Epic History TV's guide to a legendary Napoleonic warship. This video is sponsored by Fabulous, the number one self-care app that helps you build better habits and achieve your goals. Some struggles many of us face on a daily basis, staying focused, dealing with stress, getting enough sleep. With more of us now working from home or relying on ourselves for inspiration and motivation, healthy routines have never been more important. Fabulous is here to help. Based on behavioural science, their app works like a digital life coach, gently encouraging you into daily habits that over time will leave you feeling healthier, more focused and more productive. And it has some wonderfully produced videos to help you on this path. Fabulous is tailored to your specific requirements. Choose habit tracking to embed great routines into your daily life. Or journeys to work towards your specific well-being goals over several weeks. We've been using Fabulous for just a week now and already have been able to add various healthy habits to our morning routine. With a Fabulous Premium account, you can build and improve an unlimited number of habits and take part in all their programs and exercises. Start building your ideal daily routine today. The first 500 people to click on the link in our video description will get 25% off Fabulous Premium. Thanks to Fabulous for sponsoring this video. Today, HMS Victory lies in dry dock in Portsmouth, on England's south coast. A famous visitor attraction and the world's oldest commissioned warship. She's a remarkable survivor from a vanished world of sail-powered warships and global struggles between Europe's great empires. Victory was built to boost British naval power at the height of one of these struggles, the Seven Years' War. So if you're watching this from North America, you'll probably know that as the French and Indian War. Um, but the Seven Years' War was the global war that resulted from that. Construction began at Chatham Royal Dockyard in 1759. She was designed by Sir Thomas Slade, the foremost British naval architect of the age. Around 6,000 trees went into victory. Most were British oak though her lower masts were originally New England pine. Her keel was elm, 
Her upper masts and yards more flexible, fur and spruce. Which is interesting because actually a lot of timber for ship construction at this time also came from Scandinavia. So, um, because obviously Norway, Sweden are just covered in forests. So, um, but yeah, so um, the most common material f uh, for these kinds of ships was oak because it was very sturdy and tough. It's actually what gives rise to the famous um, naval song, Hearts of Oak. Um, if anyone's seen Star Trek The Next Generation, there's a, f a scene where uh, Picard is taken over by the doppel, or not replaced by the doppelganger, and he sings the song in ten forward with uh, all of the rest of the crew. Everyone's like looking around thinking what the hell's going on. Picard's normally very s stern and reserved. Uh, that song, Hearts, Hearts of Oak, that is singing is a real song. It's a naval song, and it comes from the fact that many of these ships were built of oak. The result, launched in 1765, was soon considered a masterpiece. A ship bristling with firepower, with the speed and handling of a much lighter vessel. Victory was not completed in time to take part in the Seven Years' War. She first saw action 13 years later in the American War of Independence, leading the capture of a French convoy off Ushant. When the Revolutionary Wars broke out against France, HMS Victory was the British flagship at the Allied blockade of Toulon. Then in 17... And Toulon, um, if you remember from when we covered the series on the Napoleonic Wars, is the battle where Napoleon first makes his name. 97, she was Admiral Jarvis's flagship at his great victory over the Spanish at Cape St. Vincent. It's an interesting um, little tidbit from that battle too, which is um, a lot of these naval battles are filled with like the famous um, words from the from the admirals in command. You know, there's the famous signal at Trafalgar: "England expects every man will do his duty." Things like that. Um, there's actually an interesting tidbit from Cape St. Vincent. I think Nelson actually fought at Cape St. Vincent as well. He I think he may have been a captain of one of the ships under. Um, Jervis's command, but there's um, a moment where uh, the Admiral's looking out across the sea with his telescope and, uh, sorry, one of the Admiral's assistants rather, and um, he's reeling off how many ships he's spotting and he's like, you know, the British are severely outnumbered, they're outnumbered more than two to one at this battle. And um, he's reading off the number of ships that he's spotting and he's like, 15 sail, and the, the Admiral's like, okay. And he's like, 20 sail, okay. And then he's like, 30 sail. Then eventually the Admiral just snaps and he's like, okay, enough. You know, if there's 50 sail, I'll go right through them. And it's like become kind of like a famous, um, it became like a famous uh, retort as if to say, you know, it, whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to fight them and I'm still going to win. <laughs> and he does. And it's actually from him that Nelson gets his sort of trademark aggressiveness. Victory was by then 32 years old far beyond her life expectancy of 18 years. Worn out, she was briefly threatened with being turned into one of Britain's notorious prison ships, known as Hulks. No one would have guessed that her greatest hour still lay ahead of her, because at the last minute, victory was reprieved and began a major three-year refit that cost more than she did to build. She returned to service in 1803 as Vice Admiral Nelson's flagship. Two years later, she would lead the British attack at Trafalgar and win her place in naval legend. I'd be interested to know, actually, I wonder if he'll go into this, like, why it was saved from being mothballed, because, like you said, that is kind of unusual, and especially because it cost more than the ship was to even build in the first place. Um, I wonder if it was maybe a, I mean, because I don't know, I don't know much about the history of the ship itself, so this is a learning experience for me too, but it'd be interesting to know if that was, say, a, um, maybe an admiral that had some affection for the ship, maybe, uh, was pushing for it, I don't know. By the Napoleonic Wars, a first-rate ship of the line was the world's largest and most sophisticated weapon of war, and it needed a huge crew to work efficiently. In 1805, Victory's complement was around 820, every man and boy with his designated role. 
From the Admiral of the fleet to the ship's captain, naval lieutenants and marine officers, midshipmen, warrant officers, clerks and stewards, petty officers and their mates, sailors of the able, ordinary, and landlubber variety, Royal Marines, right down to the 31 ship's boys. Before we examine HMS Victory's arrangement and structure, just a quick note as well, so 820 men, that's more than most naval ships today have as a crew. You know, a, a crew today for a, a frigate, say, is maybe 200, 300 men. Uh, but the biggest ships, aircraft carriers, they have about, you know, anywhere from, you know, the Queen Elizabeth class that the Royal Navy has is about 2,500, I think, as a standard complement. Some of the larger U.S. Navy carriers are anywhere about 5,000. So if you think this is about, you know, a quarter to a third of the crew of a pretty decent sized aircraft carrier. And that just shows, you know, how crowded these ships probably were as well. A quick reminder of some common nautical terms. The right side of the ship, starboard. The left side of the ship, larboard, which only became port in 1844 to reduce confusion. Not only that as well, but those terms, so this might actually end up being three parts actually, because there is a lot to say here. Um, but starboard comes from steerboard, and that's because um, they would have the um, like the steering oar on the right side of the ship, um, which was used before rudders became a thing. Um, so steerboard eventually became starboard, and larboard um, came from a term, I think it may have been Latin, I think, or like Old English or something. La um, it was a word that just meant loading. And the larboard side is the is the side that you would um, have when docking in port, and that's the side that you would load things onto the ship, which became larboard. Um, but because of the confusion, um, yes, is right. It became port um, because that's the side that you would dock in port on. So that's where those those two two terms come from. The back of the ship, her stern, the front her stem. Towards the stern was aft or... Sometimes called bow as well. Abaft. Towards the stem was forward or fore. Victory's middle gun deck was 186 feet long. The top of her main mast was 205 feet above the waterline. Victory's top speed was 10 knots or 11.5 miles per hour, fast for a ship her size. Mm. In 1780, she received the latest British naval innovation. Copper. Copper sheathing for her hull. This protected her timbers from shipworm, barnacles and weeds, keeping her solid and streamlined. Victory, like... Copper sheathing as well, to sheath a ship this size was very expensive, but the British Navy thought it was a worthwhile investment. And yeah, so it stopped things accumulating on the underside of the hull, which... Um, would inevitably slow the ship down, you know, if like barnacles and stuff like that was building up on the hull. Um, but by copper sheathing it, um, you didn't get that build up, so it, it kept the ship streamlined, like you said, which enabled it to maintain pretty high speeds, especially for a ship that big. Like all ships of the line was ship rigged, meaning she had three masts a foremast, main mast, and mizzen mast, and a bowsprit. Each mast was made up of sections. The lower mast, secured deep in the ship's hold, rose up through the decks to the fighting top, which served as a platform for sharpshooters in battle. Above it, the top mast. Then the cross trees, which secured the top gallant mast, pronounced to gallant. The cross trees was the lookout's position, there being no crow's nests in the Navy. Each mast supported several yards, to which the sails were fastened or bent. Victory's rigging, 26 miles of rope and 786 wow. pulleys in all, came in two types. Standing rigging gave structural support to the masts. Forestays and backstays kept them braced fore and aft. The shrouds secured the masts laterally, and their rope steps, called ratlins, were how you climbed the masts. Experienced seamen reached the tops by climbing the futter shrouds. On a rolling sea, 
This could mean mm. climbing out over the ocean upside down. So novices were advised to use the lubber's hole. The and no safety ropes either. So if that was me, <laughs> screw that. Uh, I'm not particularly good with heights as it is, but imagine climbing up, you know, a, well, about a hundred foot tall mast. No thanks. The other type of rigging was running rigging, used to operate the ship's yards and sails, and included halyards, bowlines, and clue lines. Victory had 37 sails with which to harness the power of the wind, her only real form of propulsion. They had a total area of 6,500 square yards, about the size of a football pitch, though not all sails could be set together nor did more sail necessarily mean more speed. Her large square sails included the four course, four top sail, pronounced topsail, and four top gallant sail, pronounced fortagansel. On the main mast, the main course, main topsail, and main tagansel. The mizzen mast carried a fore and aft rigged sail known as a spanker or driver as well as mizzen topsail and mizzen tagansail, while the bowsprit could carry a variety of fore and aft rigged sails, most commonly a jib and flying jib. Another 11 fore and aft rigged sails, known as staysails, could also be set. Victory's upper deck, or weather deck, was actually several decks, the foc'sle, waist, quarter deck and poop deck. Foxel being forecastle as well. The forecastle is a shortened form of oh. forecastle, <laughs> a term. Vlogging through history, curse. Take a shot. Dating back to the Middle Ages, when warships carried raised fighting platforms at both ends. The forecastle housed the belfry, containing the all-important ship's bell, rung regularly day and night to mark the change of watch. It also housed two 12-pounder guns. All guns in this period were described by the weight of shot they fired. So 12-pounders fired a solid iron ball, known as round shot, that weighed 12 pounds, about the same as a bowling ball. There were different types of ammunition as well. There was grape shot, which is just um, generally um, like a mix of smaller shots, so it's like a joint shotgun. Um, but it could be just pretty much anything. You know, you could load it with cutlery if you wanted to. Um, there's a scene in Pirates of the Caribbean, actually, where they actually do that. They're loading the cannons with anything they could find. And that could be done, you know, if you had no ammunition left. Um, but one of the um, most devastating kinds of weapon against another ship was actually, I think it was just called a uh, chain shot, which was two cannonballs that were linked together by either a solid metal bar or um, a metal chain. And when you fired it, it would spin. Um, it would catch um, like momentum and it would start spinning. And if you fired that at a mast, it just acted like a saw that would just smash the mast into pieces. And um, I believe, if anyone's seen the fantastic Master and Commander, Far Side of the World, um, with Russell Crowe, um, I think that's actually the, the type of shot that, that's used to take down the mast of the French ship Acheron in the final battle. So you can actually see it. Um, that's how it would have been used. The Foxhall also mounted two 68-pounder carronades. Mm. So these are the guns that I was talking about earlier, the big carronades that we used to um, clear enemy decks, but they could also be used, obviously, against a warship. Um, but they were more often than not used to fire multiple shots at once rather than a single 68-pound ball. The carronade was another British innovation, a short, large-caliber gun fearsome at close quarters, but lacking a cannon's range or accuracy. The beak deck... There's actually an instance where the British, I think almost as like an experiment, they armed a frigate with nothing but carronades. And so this thing had like 38 carronades or something on board, and it went up against, I think it was maybe a French warship, or it could have been a Spanish one. And even though the enemy ship had the longer range on the British ship, the British ship closed to within close range and just absolutely devastated this frigate because these guns were just incredibly powerful. They packed a hell of a punch. If you think 68 pounder, that's like what, four? No, more than that actually. It's like five, maybe even six of those, um, 
Yes, yeah, so it's almost six 12 pounders going off at once. Gave access to the bowsprit and the head. Six outdoor toilets for several hundred seamen and marines, which emptied straight into the sea below. The waste is where four of Victory's six boats were stowed. All large ships carried several boats. They were essential for ferrying men and supplies from ship to ship and ship to shore, for towing or turning the ship in adverse winds, and for launching amphibious attacks. The quarter deck was HMS Victory's command centre and housed a total of 12 12 pounder guns. From here, the ship was steered using the ship's wheel. This was the responsibility of one of the ship's eight quartermasters, assisted by his mates. The ship's wheel was connected by rope to the tiller three decks below, which was in turn connected to the rudder. The binnacle, just four of the wheel, contained the ship's magnetic compasses and a lantern by which to see them. Cabins for the captain's secretary and the ship's master were located either side of the ship's wheel. Each shared their small room with a 12-pounder gun. The stern area of the quarter deck comprised the captain's cabins, a dining room, sleeping cabin, and at the very stern of the ship, his day cabin, all sharing space with four 12-pounders. The captain also had a private toilet, known as the quarter gallery. Above the captain's cabins, the poop deck, which provided good visibility and access to the mizzenmast. It also housed the signal locker, containing the coloured flags used to communicate with other ships and shore. The Royal Navy's signals code had been recently revised by Admiral Howe. His system involved 14 flags, which could be arranged in various combinations to convey 340 messages. For emphasis, a gun might be fired. At night, signalling was by pre-agreed combinations of gunfire, coloured lanterns and rockets. OK, so um, we're about halfway in and we've sort of approached the end of a segment there, so we'll call it a day there. Um, but fantastic video so far. Um, you know, the detail that's gone into this is just astonishing, especially all the work with the um, the CG modelling that they've done as well. It's just fantastic work. I believe that may have been done on the Unreal Engine. There's um, a few videos come out recently from Invicta, I believe, on the Roman Legions, and they use uh, similar sort of CG development for that too. So fantastic production work. Um, but yeah, let me know in the comments what you think as well, and we'll return next time with part two. So in the meantime, thank you all so much for watching, and I shall catch you all on the next one.